Beachy Family Lecture in Business Law. Uh, this lecture series was launched last year with world-renowned economist Robert Schiller. Uh, we're very excited to continue that extraordinary caliber of excellence with this evening's speaker. Uh, but before I introduce this evening's speaker, I'd like to say a couple of things. Uh, one is, I'd like to request that everybody turn off their mobile phones. Uh, and not just make them silent, but literally turn them off, because it apparently interferes with uh, what's going on in this room. So that's one request. Uh, and then the second thing I want to say before I introduce this evening's speaker is um, a thank you on behalf of the University of Western Ontario. Uh, I'd like to thank Jeff Beattie and his family for his generous com commitment in establishing this prestigious speaker series. Uh, Jeff Beattie is a proud, proud graduate of this law school. He is Deputy Chairman of Thomson Reuters. Uh, he's President of the Woodbridge uh, Company Limited. Uh, and, in addition to that, this is what we're most happy about, he is also leading Western's current $500 million volunteer fundraising campaign. Uh, we're very grateful to the BT family for their support. So now on to introducing this evening's speaker, Dr. George Arthur Akerlof. He doesn't need an introduction, uh, but I'm happy to give him one anyway. Uh, Dr. Akerlof is the Koshland Professor of Economics at the University of California, Berkeley. He won the 2001 Nobel Prize in Economics, uh, shared with Michael Spence and Joseph Stiglitz, uh, when he was honored for his theory of asymmetric information. Uh, and the Nobel Committee cited Dr. Akerlof's 1970 paper, The Market for Lemons, uh, which for the first time described the role of asymmetric information in causing market perversity. Uh, his, his research more generally often draws from other disciplines, including psychology, anthropology, and sociology. Uh, and he has played an important role in the development of the behavioral school of economics. Uh, in fact, it's not an understatement to say Dr. Akerlof is pioneer in the application of sociology and psychology uh, to the workings of the macroeconomy. Uh, most recently, uh, publishing in 2009 with uh, Robert Schiller, Animal Spirits, How Human Psychology Drives the Economy, and why it matters for global capitalism. And then just in addition to that, earlier this year, publishing with Rachel Crampton, Identity Economics, How Our Identities Shape Our Work, Wages, and Well-Being. I could go on for a long, long time introducing this speaker, but I won't. That's not the point of this evening, and I myself am here to hear him speak. I'll just finish by saying Dr. Akerlof is simply one of the most significant eco uh, economists today. We're delighted to have him here at Western. And I would now like to call on Dr. Akerlof to deliver the second annual family lecture, the second annual BT family lecture uh, in business law. Identity economics, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. George Akerlof. Thank you very much. Um, I'm especially honored to be here. Um, and I especially wanted to give this talk in uh, your law school because I think that what I have to say here about identity economics is important to law. And uh, those of you who study law and economics may, may especially perceive that this may be important to law and economics. Can you hear me? Just now. Okay. Just now. Okay, good. So you can hear me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let me begin. Um, First of all, I'd like to say thanks to Rachel Cranton. Oh, let's see. Let's see whether I can. Oops. Now I'm not allowed to go back. Uh, so let's. Well, so I'd like to say thanks to Rachel Cranton. Uh, this lecture is based on the book Identity Economics uh, that I've just completed with Rachel Cranton. And I'll tell you how that book began. So it was the spring of 1996. And Rachel wrote me a letter, and that letter said that the paper that I'd just written on social distance had missed the concept of identity. She also said that concerns regarding identity were a serious omission from economic theory. Well, I wasn't pleased to receive this letter, which said that my previous paper was all wrong. Also, I actually thought Rachel was in error. I thought that identity was just an aspect of people's tastes. And as a result, I sort of thought that standard economic theory had already taken full account of it. 
So as it turned out, Rachel and I had both recently moved to Washington. She had been a graduate student at Berkeley, and she had moved to the University of Maryland, and I had gone to Brookings uh, when my wife had gone to the Federal Reserve. And so Rachel and I agreed to get together, and we mulled over for many months. And after that, we discovered that identity really does have a meaning. It's well defined in the concept of economic modeling. We also decided that it was a major factor missing from current economics. And I hope that you, who know a lot of law, will see that it's also a factor missing from law, from the law and economics. So, uh, now, since that time, we've written a series of articles and also a book on the subject. And uh, this lecture is a summary of that book, which is Identity Economics, as I've shown you. Now, there are a very large number of economists who do not like what we do. And what they think we're doing is they think we're violating the rules. So maybe, I think maybe we'll get some questions about this in the answer period. And I think I have answers to those questions. But I actually think that, that it's the other way around. I think economists more generally misunderstand what the rules should be. They cite the rules of economics but that the rules of economics violate the more general rules of science and how people tend to do science. So this is my strategy on this. When I was a child, I used to read a series of books called the Freddy books. And uh, they were about a talking pig who lived in upstate New York. Now there's some 30 books in this series and they're all about some different adventure of Freddy, and Freddy did a lot of things. Freddy was a politician, he goes to Florida, he went to Mars, he flew a balloon, etc., etc. So my aim with Rachel here is to write such a series. It's not supposed to be the Freddy series, but the Identity series. So even though people initially find identity discordant, it's my hope that with persistence over a very long period of time, the people will get used to the idea. And instead of identity being something that you should not consider, it will gradually become part of the expected, accepted landscape. So remember that the rock and roll of the 1950s and 1960s is now considered the golden oldies that your grandparents now uh, listen to fondly. So with that prefatory note, let me begin. Okay. So think about standard economics. Standard economics is about incentives. Okay. For example, that's the main theoretical theme of Freakonomics. By training its sites on price incentives, standard economics is price theory. But that takes us to the central question of this lecture. Are there types of motivation? Are there types of motivation that are not described in current price theory? Or that are incorrectly described in current economics? Of course, there may be other sorts of missing or incorrect motivation, but Rachel and I think that this is a particularly important one. We ask the question there whether there's a systematic way to think about and to characterize this motivation. Our goal is to analyze it by tools that are very similar to what we use for price theory. Now, sociologists have described this motivation as concerned with identity. These motivations are all but absent. They're all but absent in current price theory and in current economics. Yet, it has serious impact for many of the most important economic problems. Okay. So now let's talk about the standard method of economics. Standard economics is based on a method. It's based on the maximization of objective farming. So all those who've had a lot of economics know this. Typically it's said that consumers maximize utility functions and firms maximize profit functions. Now this may be a good way of doing economics. The description of what people are maximizing gives a way to classify how firms and consumers both behave. It classifies their motivation, so it's a nice classificatory tool. But economists But economists' characterization of these motivations is now very narrow. Economists miss important aspects of motivation. Now, people typically have opinions as to how they should or the how they should not behave. They also have views on how others should or should not behave. Their views also 
about how they and others should behave depends also upon who people think they are. Sociologists would say that it depends on their identity. So what does that mean in terms of standard economics? It means that they lose utility insofar as they or others fail to live up to these beliefs regarding what people should or should not do. Now such notions are central. They're central to motivation in modern sociology, but they're absent from economists' representations of utility or of motivation. People's views of how they and others should or not should not behave has a name, they are called norms. Now these views may be held with great conviction, but they're usually not moral or ethical views. They can be, but they're usually not. For example, I'll give you one <coughs> such view. That is, I should not de deliver this lecture while wearing shorts. So I'm not wearing shorts. So, so now that takes us to another concept. Sociology has a further concept that gives an easy and natural way to add these norms to the utility function or to motivation. Sociologists say that people have an ideal for how they should or should not behave. Furthermore, people often conceptualize that ideal in terms of people of some sort. That person may be somebody they know, it may be someone they do not know, or it may even be an imaginary person. So we can then bring this standard into standard economics by a simple device. We just modify the utility functions that express people's motivations. We modify the utility functions to add a loss in utility that depends on the distance of behavior from that ideal. So let me give you an example to show you that this really does matter. Religion affords many examples of norms that are described as the behavior of an ideal person who is the founder or the prophet of the, of the religion. So consider Christianity's use of the Gospels. The Gospels describe the life of Christ, and this is what Christians believe. Christi a Christian believes that she ought to take the Gospel of Christ as the model of behavior. A Christian thinks she should be ashamed, and so far she does not live up to her interpretation of the Gospels. But then religion is only one of the many realms where people have such an ideal. Now, to appreciate the ubiquity of norms and motivation, it's useful to see some further examples. And what do those examples illustrate? They demonstrate that people tend to be happy when they live up to how they think they should be, and they're correspondingly unhappy when they fail to live up to those norms. Okay, okay so here's an example that should be familiar to those of you who have taught. A teacher usually has a clear view of what it means to be a good teacher. So when I teach a good class, I feel good about myself. And I have some kind of nice warm glow or something like that for the rest of the day or something like that. When I feel a, teach a bad class, I really feel quite bad about myself. So if the teacher lives up to that standard, she feels good about herself. And if she falls short, she may even feel quite miserable. Now, the same feelings apply to almost any activity from playing golf to being a parent. And it applies to the conduct of most jobs. So Randy Hodson, a sociologist at Ohio State, surveyed ethnographies of the US workplace. And this is what he found. He found that most employees care about their dignity at work. That's the title of his book. They want to conceive of what they do as useful and they feel a lack of dignity if they are thwarted. Those who are unable to get such satisfaction, you will see, are likely to show their displeasure by acting up in some way or other. Now, the feminine mystique gives what may be as good a description of norms and their impact on people's lives as can be found anywhere. So anyone who hasn't read it, it's, it's, or anyone who, maybe even anybody who has should, should, might want to read this book, so if you're looking for a good book to read. Or if you had read it a long time ago, you might want to reread it. So here's a brief sample of Betty Friedan's descriptions of the norms of a middle-class housewife on Long Island in the early 1960s. Okay. So, millions of women, blah, 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 lived their lives, etc. They gloried in their role as women and wrote proudly on the census blank occupation housewife. 
So most women agreed with those norms. But there were dissenters, dissenters like Friedan, who disagreed. And they felt to follow a, a norm with which they disagreed. Friedan has said, says that they had the problem without a name. And they were unhappy. They were unhappy because they were failing to live up to other people's norms for how they were supposed to behave. Well, we may appeal to religious texts, to work uh, ethnographies, and like for Dan, to women's magazines to see the role of norms. But the sociologist Irving Goffman has found an example that's yet better. So what he found was he found a natural experiment that's revealing of adherence to norms. He observed the behavior of children of different ages when they were brought to the local merry-go-round. Now, because appropriate activity differs by age, the children should have predictably different reactions. For the toddlers, riding a wooden horse is an accomplishment. So, okay, so you're supposed to look at that guy. In the, in, in the slide, you get a little bit more of his face, but you can see how happy he is. So what did they do? They show their joy at fulfilling what they should do with smiles and waves as they pass by. In contrast, for older children, there's a gap between their conception of how they should behave and riding the merry-go-round. They feel the need to distance themselves from an activity that's so age inappropriate. So they do so by riding a frog rather than a serious animal like a horse, where they show off by standing up dangerously during the ride. In some way or other, what they do is they play the clown. So last summer, I observed this at the local merry-go-round in my local park in Berkeley. And it was exactly as predicted. The three and four-year-olds waved merrily to the parent on the sidelines as they passed. But I especially watched a 13-year-old who went onto the merry-go-round. And this is what he did. He first warily sat on an ostrich. He later switched to a horse. And then he went into another animal, and finally, while the merry-go-round was still turning, he seems to have gotten off in back as I lost sight of him. But such behavior, of course, is not just the stuff of kids. In surgical operations, because of their inexperience, medical students are given tasks that are ridiculously easy. But how do they behave? They respond in the same way as the older children at the merry-go-round. What they do is they have to act the clown. So these examples are then illustrative. They're illustrative of behavior that's pervasive. Sociology is dense in example of people's views as to how they and others should behave. They show their joy when they live up to those standards, and they show their discomfort and reactions when they fail to do so. Is the mic working okay, or is there a resonance? It's okay. Okay, um, okay. so my, our question is, how does this apply to economics? So now I'm going to give you something a little bit theoretical, so you have to live with this for the next five minutes or so. In the typical textbook example, people have utilities for apples and bananas. And the typical demand curve is set in economics. It's said to be derived as people choose the best combination at each price and each level of income of the apples and bananas that they will buy. Now, economists have been very clever in altering the utility function to take into account many social situations. But they've not altered it in a way that takes into account identity. What that entails is the following. For people to have a view of who they are, like the examples, the Christian of the teacher and of the children of the merry-go-round. And corresponding to who they are, they have an ideal for behavior. <coughs> that means they lose utility insofar as they do not live up to that ideal. They may also have an ideal for how others behave, and then they lose utility insofar as others do not behave that way. And then, interestingly, and sometimes tragically, sometimes the opposite. People often seek to restore their identity, and that's particularly interesting because many of these reactions, such as dueling and making foreign wars, are very perverse. So it's useful to make a habit of adding the considerations that I've just described to people's motivation, to people's utility functions. 
not only is it useful, it's easy and straightforward. So there's a, then there is an easy and simple three-step procedure for adding identity to standard economics. So what is that procedure? Okay, so uh, there's step one. In any situation, characterize how the individual conceives of herself, which is how the decision maker conceives of herself. As I said before, a sociologist has a name for that. They, a sociologist would call that her identity. They also call it her social category. Um, step two, corresponding to this identity, ask what is her ideal for how she should behave. Now, we're going to denote that ideal as E star, and E star depends upon how she conceives upon, of herself. It depends upon her social category or her identity. So this ideal, to remind you, is then E star, that's how she thinks she should behave, and E, and e star depends upon C. It depends upon her identity. So why do we use the letter E? Because in many of these problems, ideal effort is a key variable. Okay. And then what's step three of the three steps? procedure, then ask how unhappy she will be insofar as her actual behavior, which we denote as E, departs from this ideal behavior, E star. Add this to the utility function. So she has the standard economic utility. We don't, we have no argument with standard economics. We think it's correct insofar as it goes, which depends on standard economic variables. And then she has an additional argument to her utility function which depends upon the distance between her ideal behavior and her actual behavior. Knowing this will then give you a prediction how she will behave. Now there's an innovation here, and that is central to sociology, but we do not see it in economics. The innovation here, which every sociology takes as second nature, is that the utility function is not fixed. This ideal, which is E star, depends on the person's uh, identity. That's the moving part here that makes this theory different, that makes it different from standard economics. Now there's also an easy and important extension. In addition, according to the procedure, in many problems people not only care uh, that they are living up to their own identity, but their identity is affected by other people's actions. And then they may be motivated to act on this in turn. For many problems this should also be added entered into the utility function. Now I think you're going to be surprised at how important concerns about identity are for your own happiness and all for, also for most of the decisions that you make. Also, many but not all of the counterintuitive statements of economics are wrong. They're wrong because economists have the wrong model. Turns out that this method of analysis explains a great deal of people's motivations. It's the stuff that gossip and People magazine is made of, and all of that stuff is important. It's important for our own motivation, and it's important for, to, uh, for the motivation of others. And it explains the motives of everyone, from school children, as we've seen, to the most ruthless dictators. So let me give you the outline for the remainder of the lecture. Okay, so here's the outline of the remainder. So that is, uh, so we're going to discuss six topics. The economics of minority poverty, the economics of education, the economics of organizations, the economics of gender in the workplace, of gender in the household, of macroeconomics. We're going to discuss four functional changes to economics, and then I'll give a conclusion. And I may, I'm going to skip a lot for a lack of time. Okay. So that takes us to the first detail example, uh, which is the economics of impoverished minorities. The worst problem to my mind, social problem in the United States, is the social conditions of African Americans. Progress was made in the civil rights movement, but remarkable inequality remains. At current rates of imprisonment in the United States, the probability that an African American male spends some time in prison is somewhere between 30 and 40 percent. And Prison is not jail. Prison is something serious. The average male who enters prison at some time in his life will spend on average five years there. As I speak, one out of nine African American males, 20 to 34, is behind bars. Now that's really terrible. Furthermore, two-thirds of African American births are out of wedlock. 
Even before the Great Recession began, 40% of African Americans, males 25 to 34, were not employed, and for high school dropouts, it was worse. According to Derek Neal, it was 60%. Such non-employment, out of wedlock birth, and incarceration are so very high that they require an explanation that goes beyond illegal racial discrimination. So for that, we turn to identity. Historically, there's been a different code for how blacks and whites should behave in America. Some of it, as you all know, was even formalized in the law, and that code told blacks and whites how they should behave. It also spe specified punishments for transgressions. So when Rosa Park refused to give up her bus seat for a white, she was arrested and she was fined. When Richard Wright was given an optometry job deemed only appropriate for whites, the other employees threatened him and they forced him to quit. And Emmett Till was lynched. Now such actions are now illegal and most Americans now think it was morally wrong. Yet, in the words of economist Glenn Lowry, white Americans, even when well-intentioned, still think of a white American as us and a black American as them. Such difference between us and them is the origin of an oppositional identity. The psychological effects of thinking of some people as us and others of them are very powerful. And it's especially powerful when the them-us divide splits those who are in the dominant culture with a great deal of money and power from those who are a poor minority, and is yet more powerful when this minority has been very, very, very badly treated in the past. They are likely to adopt a view of themselves in opposition to the we of the dominant culture. Such opposition comes from a basic human emotion. If they thumb their noses at us, we want to thumb our noses at them. Now this rejection is self-affirming, but it also comes at an economic cost. With this identity, it is difficult to adopt the behaviors expected in a majority-dominated workplace. So, oppositional culture is the leading theory among African-American scholars for the continuance of African-American poverty. And here's a list of some of those scholars. Such uh, opposition and the motivation behind it are evident. They're evident every hour of the day and night. All you need to do is to tune in to rap music. Now, oppositional culture can be easily represented by simple changes to the standard economic model, such as we've been recommended according to a three-part procedure. Those who accepted the dominant culture are Okay, I seem to miss one. Okay, so I'll tell you that. Those who accept the dominant culture are insiders. They think that they should put in a high level of effort. That is E-star. That is the ideal for insider. On the contrary, those who feel that they cannot accept the dominant culture are outsiders. They have a different level of effort that they think they should put in. Those are the different level of the ideal effort, E-star, for outsiders. Of course, effort here is a general word. It's a general word describing a whole penumbra of different behaviors. So there's all kinds of economic policy. I think I'm going to skip this because of what I want to do in this lecture is I want to show you how, how applying these three steps in, many, in different uh, areas gives you very different economics. And here, you go through the economics policy, and you get a very different view of what economic policy should be. And you can imagine it. And uh, I'll, I'm going to skip that for, because I'm running slightly behind them. Oh, except that I have something important here. <laughs> OK. So one of the things is, uh, so a significant number of sh studies have shown that African-American children are very sensitive to the quality of their education. They respond much more than white children to small class size, and they also respond much more than white children to excellent teacher. And then there are miracle schools. These schools, even the most violent neighborhoods, have produced excellent educational results. So there are two examples that we have in the book. One is the Comer Schools in New Haven, Connecticut, and the other is the Central Park East Secondary Schools in Harlem. 
And they, what they've shown is that by taking a sensitive approach to students' problems, they can uh, obtain very good outcomes. So at the elementary level, Comer achieved excellent test results. And Central Park East Secondary School achieved, in Harlem, achieved rates of high school graduation and college continuance that would have looked good in the richest suburbs. Now, what did all of these miracle schools do? What all of these miracle schools have done, have done uh, they have done well because they've led the students to have a positive ideal for how they should behave in school. And that, of course, is the whole point of this lecture. So let me illustrate with a brief anecdote. So when Comer took over as advisor to the Baldwin School in New Haven, Connecticut, the place was a mess. It was impossible to get the students to sit down for an effective class. And then what his program did was it taught administrators, teachers, parents, and students that there was an appropriate way to behave in that school. In terms of our model, there's an e-star. There's an ideal for how one should behave in that school. And it was Comer's goal to affect that ideal. So Comer knew that his program had become a success at the beginning of its fifth year. Uh, that was when he saw a new student begin a fist fight. And then as Comer watched, one of the continuing students intervened, and this is what he said. He said, we do not do that in this school. But that's exactly the point, that the cure to this problem is to give students a view regarding what we do and what we do not do in this school. That's a problem that's not going to be solved solely by a curriculum, but by teaching students and teachers and administrators and parents, one by one, the ideal of what it means to be a good student. And apparently that's possible. Okay, so now it's, I'm gonna, I have a lot of bother about it. it's possible only if we have good good teachers, blah, blah, blah. Okay. okay, so now let's go to our next topic, which is the economics of education. So that takes us as a segue into the economics of education. In our reading of the literature on the economics of education, the most basic question in the economics of education has been, how much education do people get? That, there's a name for that. It's called the demand for education. Okay, and then Economists have also asked what are the returns from an extra year of education. As I see it, they have found that the returns are quite high. Third question regarding the economics of education is what effect do different programs have on academic achievement? But Rachel and I found that education practitioners have very different questions and also different answers. So educational practitioners and scholars want to describe what makes a school work and what causes it to fail. Typically, they write school histories and ethnographies. <coughs> so let me give you three snippets regarding US schools and show how they relate to identity. So Rachel and I reread this literature, and we were surprised at the emphasis in histories of US schooling on immigrants in the US in the late 19th century. And why that? Well, it's, they say, these ethnographies say that the school teachers at this time felt it was their mission, it was their mission to Amer Americanize their students. They would even tell them how to dress and whether or not they needed a haircut. While well, the students found this insulting, and some of them put up with it, but many simply dropped out. Rightly or wrongly, it was the mission of the school teachers to change their students' identities. So the historians have emphasized this behavior in the 19th century schools because education scholars claim, they claim that U.S. public schools have, absolved, have evolved into the exact opposite. Okay. So that takes us to the second theme of this literature. Second theme from this literature is then that the current U.S. high school has evolved into shopping mall high. It's not because it physically resembles a shopping mall as it probably does in California but rather because the attitude of the school is the attitude of the shopping mall. The shopping mall, the shops give you what you want. In contrast to the book Shopping Mall High, the purpose of the school should be to change who the students are. That's what the old teachers did in their caring but insulting way. Those teachers had a view of who their students should be, and then they worked to impose it. But 
shopping mall high just caters to the pre-existing demands in school. So presumably, if you want a good education, you can get it. That is the honors track. But if you want to get no education at all, the schools have programs for that. And actually, it looks quite fun if you want to read a fun book. And it, it describes that. So most of all, the schools are scared stiff of insulting their students and telling them what they think they should or should not be doing. In this view, the problem with U.S. education is that it's not doing its duty. It's failing to impart the proper identity to its students. So then there's a third theme in the sociology and history of education, and that's associated with the late great sociologist James Coleman. What Coleman said was that schools are little societies, and these little societies have norms and identities of their own. These norms are not the norms of the adults who presumably, who think they do, run the schools. They're the norms of the, of the students who go to them. And Coleman entitled his book on this, Adolescent Society. And he said the norms are set by the leading crowd. Now there's a recent paper by John and Michael Bishop, and they've taken the, the Coleman method one step further. The Bishop's surveys asked students about the leading crowd. They asked the student about the extent to which they felt they needed to conform because of bullying. So the bishops relate the very sad story of a poor young child in middle school who wanted to be what he called straight, straight rather than a part of the leading crowd. And you can guess what happened to him. This young man was shunned by all of his erstwhile friends. So, and the bishops have especially then given a picture of the roles of the leading crowd and they, how they have very large effect on the norms of the school. And that, of course, was Coleman's original point. They paint a picture that the leading crowds trump the norms that the teachers in the school would like to set. The leading crowd controls because those who belong think that others should behave according to their norms and they get utility by enforcing those norms on those who do not obey them. So the bishops find that there's a great deal of bullying and teasing in U.S. middle schools and high schools, and those who do not like the norms set by the leading crowd then have a difficult choice. They may choose to be unpopular on the one hand, or to join them on the other hand. Uh, but of course, much of the time, they don't even have a choice because they simply look or act different from how the leading crowd thinks they should be. So there are two terrible things about the norms of a leading crowd. The first is that they involve a great deal of bullying, and those who, those who do not behave as the leading crowd thinks they should in the typical school face a difficult life. The direct suffering caused by bullying should make its eradication a priority in all schools, but then its effects go beyond this. And that's the second terrible thing about these norms. They determine the ideal type of who the students should be changes the ideal type as all of the students have to come to terms. They have to come to terms with how to deal with the bullies. So the message of this literature is that the economics of schooling, uh, what makes a good school and what makes a bad school, comes from the identities that, students, that schools manage to impart to their students. It matters who those in the leading crowd think they should be. The implications of this literature is that good schooling is schooling that imposes on the school population the proper notion of who one should be in this school. That, as I said earlier, is the exact opposite of shopping mall high. So once again, we see that the standard economic theory leaves out something essential. Let's go back to the three questions in the economics of education. And we'll see that identity then affects all three of them in a major way. It affects the dropout rate because that is largely determined by the ideal for how much education students think they should get. And that's out of the standard economics. It affects the quality of the education, as we've seen. And it's extremely important, as we've also seen, in the respective success or failure of different school interventions or experiments. Uh, so that takes us to the third area that I can discuss in detail. And that's the economics of organization. So most economic activity takes place within organizations. So what makes organizations work? The standard economic theory of organizations says that they will work if people in different jobs are given the right economic incentives. So you can see books. 
uh, taught to MBAs, especially, which gives that as a theory of what makes organizations work. But a careful reading, actually, if you go back and read the economics literature carefully, as actually at least two very good economists done, have done, a careful reading of the economics actually gives the opposite answer. Okay? So I'll give you that answer. In this view, no matter what the incentives of an organization, its employees will find a way to use them to their own advantage rather than for their original purpose. So let me motivate this by an example from Freakonomics, where Steve Levitt found that Chicago school teachers responded to their financial incentives by directly filling in their students' answer books. So after the students, you know, I thought what the school teachers would do, they might teach to the test. That's what you're I guess that's what you're supposed to do. But then what they they said, they said you know, they get you to believe they're wrong, and then you know you finish their 30 questions and they fill in 18 to 30 right. Uh, and then Steve, who was a good statistician, he went and identified some of these, and they fired 10 to 20 teachers and scared, I guess, the rest of them. <laughs> so, uh, there's one way, and perhaps an only one way, around such gaming of incentives. In organizations that work, employees identify with their organization. Or perhaps no, more narrowly, they identify with their task within their organization. In this case, in terms of the language that we've been talking about, about insiders and outsiders, in this case, the workers think of themselves as insiders. In terms of the model that we're constantly applying, they have one value of their ideal effort, E star, if they're insiders, and they have another value of E star, their ideal, if they're outsiders. If they're insiders, they want to do their jobs, and this very much reduces the conflict of interest between the organizations and their employees. So the key result of our chapter on organizations is that if people identify with the organization or if they identify with their job in it, then the optimal variation in pay is much less than if people do not identify with it. That, in our view, is what allows organizations to work. Because if you have relatively little variation in pay, then people don't have an opportunity to gain the system. So, um, they work then, organizations work, when uh, people who are given a job identify with it. Why is that what makes organizations work? Because in our interpretation, the standard economic theory of organization mainly shows that variable compensation does not work. It does not work because people like the Chicago school teachers will fa always find a way to gain any system with which we have not identified. So once again, once again, we see that a key variable that has been left out of the analysis is, is E star, ideal effort. And key motivation that's left out is how people feel bad when their effort E has not lived up to their ideal E star. In bad organizations, employees are outsiders, uh, and E star is low, and people do what they can get away with. In good organizations, employees are insiders, and the E star is high, and people want to do what their jobs say they should do. So I can illustrate this again with the example from the very beginning of the lecture. When I teach a class that goes well, I feel good about it. When I give a bad one, I'm ashamed. And I'm not doing it for the pay, I'm doing it because of my ideal that I should be a good teacher, and I think that's how I should behave. So North American universities are said to work well, I think they do work well, and I think they do so because all of us have very strong identifications, and very strong identifications of being good teachers and also good uh, researchers. So, how do we know that this addition to the theory is relevant? Well, we know it's relevant because it has policy implications. If you just go by the standard economics, there are areas where you would get the wrong descriptions of what you ought to do. So the policy implications of survival identifications are relevant to every organization from schools to businesses to the United States Army. In terms of economists' traditional concerns regarding pay, if workers identify with their organization, then they do not need much variable compensation to get workers to do their jobs. There may, however, need to be a high level of pay to get workers to join the organization or to keep them from going elsewhere. 
But the idea that CEOs need enormous pay incentives, that is wrong. That's a very a wrong idea. And if you know the graduate level uh, economics, uh, what, what's, uh, what, what I guess is not yet gotten into the textbooks <laughs> on organization theory, then in fact you know that uh, that is wrong. A CEO who does not deeply care about his ship should not be the captain of it. In fact, we all know now in this financial crisis that a CEO who gets highly variable pay, and that is what he cares about, is very dangerous because he will gain the system to increase his pay. And we have seen that time and time and time again as this financial crisis unfolds. Um, the other, now there's another general conclusion, okay? and I don't know whether this is applicable to the law or not, but it might, I think it might give you a way to think about that. Okay? The other, another general conclusion is that people who have jobs have a duty to do their jobs. They are fiduciaries. Now, I don't know whether this is a researchable topic or not, but it seems that legal, we should be thinking about legal arrangements that are less specific than current law in punishment of specific misdeeds. Why? Because the basic crime of office, the basic crime of office should be the failure to meet its responsibilities. Maybe, in fact, this is the way the law is written, and maybe let's, let's have a discussion about that. Since such fulfillment of fiduciary duty to office should be the fundamental motive of the office holder, then an efficient law would also make the fundamental, it the fundamental crime of non-fulfillment. So I do know, I think I know enough to say that US law as currently written tends to punish white collar crime for the violation of some technicality rather than for the real crime. And it's the real crime what is the real crime? The real crime is gross neglect of fiduciary responsibility. So actually, in all of these, in these big cases like Milken and Boski, they got the people for some kind of very specific violation, rather than for what they did. What they did was <laughs> they did something terrible, each and every one of them. Okay, so, um, so I think I'm going to skip the economics of gender. Um, there is a section in the book on the economics of gender that's direct, and it has direct application to uh, to the law to the law of um, of sexual harassment and gender discrimination. Uh, where does that arise? It says basically that we that the standard model of this and the stand actually a lot of the cases have misunderstood what the economics of gender should be. So. Uh, now, you may correct me on this, so you know more about this than I, but uh, as we read the literature that what was very important in the United States uh, in, the, in, the, in sexual harassment law was Catherine McKinnon. And Catherine McKinnon tended to view sexual harassment as having to do with something that was sexual um, in some uh, explicit way, that it shouldn't take place in the... Um, in the workplace. Our view of sexual harassment, I, we, we have no quibble with, with that definition of, of sexual harassment, but we view it as actually something more general and as something where the basic pro problem of most sexual harassment is that some kind of task should be gendered, inappropriately gendered. It should be considered as more a male job than a female job or perhaps in some cases it's more a female job, and, and that that actually is what, was what laws behind uh, sexual, uh, most sexual harassment. And in fact, that there, there, there is some legal, uh, there, is, there is sort of incipient cases which are very interesting, which make that the basis for a sexual, as a sexual harassment violation. And uh, so our view of uh, sexual harassment is, uh, is is very is different, and you get a different view from the stand both from the standard economic model and even what's being currently applied for the most part in the courts. Okay, um, let's see. So gender in the workplace. Let's see how we're doing for time. Uh, okay, so sexual harassment. Okay. Economics of the household. Uh, that's
it's very interesting, but I'm going to skip it. Macroeconomics. Uh, okay, we just skip macroeconomics. Okay, so now I come to the four functional reasons why identity makes a risk. Why does, would, would this change uh, economics? Well, there are four uh, reasons. One is because people directly care about identity, and that's one reason we can just enter that. Uh, second is that there are externalities due to identity. Uh, let's see. Uh, there, I, I, externalities. Uh, economists are always interested when there's uh, externalities. Let me give you one example of that. For the United States, at least in one time in our history, it was a matter of war and peace. A common view among U.S. historians is that the major cause of the Civil War uh, was that Northerners and Southerners had different views of how one should behave. They actually, they, they couldn't agree. They couldn't come to an agreement. You know, the simple thing, the, the natural thing should have been that basically the whole country should have, well, it would have been much cheaper to have um, just paid people to have freed the slaves and given, given um, and just paid people indemnity. You know, we would have, it was such a terrible war, which had such a huge cost, it would have been so much cheaper. We, that didn't happen. Uh, manipulation of others. One of the wonderful things about identity is that it brings in all kinds of ways in which people try to manipulate others, and in fact they do. This is first order in terms of advertising, it's first order in terms of politics, and it's first order in lots of other things. Um, time inconsistency. People often change their identity, so that's one of the interesting things. Um, and they become a different person. Now that's different from, from the usual economic uh, view as to how people behave. As people change their identity, their norms and ideals also change. In the traditional view of economics, life is a game of chess, where each move anticipates what will follow. But here, instead, life isn't a game of chess. Life is a series of only partially connected episodes. And these episodes, what happens is people have different goals corresponding to how they conceive themselves at the time. Uh, so our slide here uh, lists some of the transitions we can get people to think of themselves as different persons. Things like graduations, confirmations, bar mitzvahs, weddings, uh, taking on offices, and so forth. So when you become the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, you're going to think of yourself differently, you know, the day before. Who are you? You are somebody running around the streets of Toronto, and then you become Chief Justice, and you become a different person. I don't, do you still wear a wig? Uh, anyway, you become a different person. And people will think of you differently, too. Okay, so let's come to the conclusion. I don't know if this is the best conclusion. So I've given you an outline of some of the ways in which the introduction of identity gives different economics and different policy conclusions. It involves a new use of just standard economic theory that captures many important <coughs> motivations. So how do you do it? You say, in any given situation, just think about who the person thinks she is. Then think about what her ideal must be, being that person in that situation, and how much utility she's going to lose if she does not live up to that ideal. Uh, you may also want to think about others' reactions to how she should or should not behave. And um, we think that it's possible that this analysis plays an important role in every area of economics. And I must say I'm particularly pleased to talk here today because I think it plays an especially important role in the area of law and economics. And so I think that, especially regarding the workings of the law, I think that all depends the, 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 the key glue that keeps together how the law works and how courts are able to enforce things all depends upon people caring about how they think they should behave. And they have very strong views in, in societies that work that they should be fulfilling the duty of the law. Whereas in societies that don't work, it seems to me that the major reason they do not work is people somehow are, don't believe that they have to live up to what the law should be says they should be doing it. This is really fundamental. And uh, so I think this plays a major role. I think when I was uh, looking at the Cooter book um, uh, before coming in here. And, uh, you know, there's a lot in that book that's right. But I feel that uh, there's also 
a lot of amendment to that book that, uh, that this gives us reason uh, to question. And, uh, you know, hopefully there's a lot of good research.